Upcoming next is Nick, Nick Ascoli. Nick is a cybersecurity researcher and a founder of Fortress. And he has led security research and OSINT investigations, which uncovered several large-scale large -scale cybercrime operations. Apart from that, Nick has been a guest speaker in multiple conferences and has been on the cyber uh, on the cybersecurity front, conferences front for a very long time. Right. The topic that Nick will be covering is Leakonomics 101. Then the last year, the last year in data leaks. Now this looks like a very interesting topic because data leaks like have been happening on a very frequent basis. Let's hope we are not in the leak list. All right. Have a good one. Uh, please welcome Nick on the stage. Hello, test. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Nick Ascoli. My talk is Leakonomics 101, the last year in data leaks. It's going to be a year in review from last August, basically, to this August. And also, I just learned someone else used the term Leakonomics in a talk recently, so I thought I invented it. I did not. So I apologize to the original, original inventor of the word. But this is Leakonomics 2 then, and theirs was Leakonomics 1. Uh, so I'm Nick Ascoli, founder and CEO of a company called Fortrace. Um, I've held several threat research roles uh, in my past, and I also volunteer, uh, you know, uh, my OSINT free time at a group called the Traverse Project, which is a counter human trafficking uh, group. It's very cool if anyone has some free time and is very into OSINT. Uh, it's a really good group to get involved with, and I'm happy to make some intros. And that's my email and my um, Twitter or X and Mastodon, so you can find me there and connect and ask me questions or yell at me. Uh, so before we get into the juicy bits of the actual events of the last year, I just want to quickly clarify that there is a difference between a data leak and a data breach. It is a small, well, small but significant difference, even though the outcome is often the same. These terms get used interchangeably a lot in the media, and you know I'm guilty of using them interchangeably at times too. It's very common and easy to do. but. Simply put, a data leak is when sensitive data is publicly accessible. It's exposed somewhere. It's like if I was, if I had a file on display here that you could all see, a physical document that you are all looking at, that is a data leak. It's not a breach. It's just you guys can look at it if you want, and that data is, in theory, leaking. A data breach is a successful attempt to steal sensitive data from a company's digital infrastructure. Not always sensitive data, but the idea is data is being taken from a spot instead of simply observed where it lies, even if the outcome is the same. So by its nature, in the event of a data leak, the data itself, regardless of where it came from, is publicly accessible. Anyone can look at it. You get the idea. In a data breach, not necessarily the case. Though a leak can result in the breach, uh, a breach does not necessarily mean the data was public in the first place. Common leak scenarios that we'll go over are like misconfigured web apps, API vulnerabilities, uh, file systems being made public and enumerated or you know indexed by search engines, and then breach scenarios are the ones we're all you know intimately familiar with at this point: internal compromises, campaigns, post exploitation frameworks, um, that stuff. The common root of a data leak is an accident. An overwhelming majority of the ones that we'll cover today, the origin of them was an accident, a misconfiguration, a vulnerability, something in the public, usually something relatively simple that led to the data getting out there. Uh, and in, in a data breach, there is intention. There is an actor acting with intention to find the data, um, and then occasionally they'll leak it out afterwards. Oftentimes, they'll keep it for their own use. But the outcome can be the same in most cases. The organization's sensitive data uh, has been accessed by an unauthorized third party. So a small distinction, but important to make. Uh, and in the trends of data leaks recently, a lot of the high impact and high profile ones that we'll talk about here did not involve anything beyond like a Shodan query or poking around on a public Jenkins server or like the right Google dork. This is not complicated stuff. These are not, you know, people are not writing O days to find the larger leaks that we've heard of this year. Um, which is emblematic of this sort of like front loading of reconnaissance that people are doing and bad guys are doing too because why go through some complicated internal uh, campaign when the right Google dork will net you the same result of the data you're looking for in the first place. So the crown jewels are online now. Uh, and to that point, the crown jewels that we're talking about here, as is typical with data leak, is like user records, usernames and passwords, sometimes sensitive IP of a company. Um, and back in the day, uh, when some of us got started in the industry, crown jewels were sitting uh, inside the company, usually, you know, well beyond the firewall or behind the firewall, 
uh, DLP would away from everything else so that if it ever moved on the wire, you'd detect it. Sitting on an app server on the intranet cannot be pinged from the internet, right? It was an application server hosting all of the all of a company's internal files or databases only to be accessed from other intranet focused applications. The crown jewels of today, at least in some of what we'll talk about, are like in SharePoint Online, they're on the internet, they're accessible by anyone with an internet connected toaster uh, because someone clicked share via URL on like a SharePoint directory or a Google Drive or something and like the CASB you have set up isn't connected to the tenant because someone else set it up, it's like a shadow IT thing and the forward proxy that you should have turned on is disabled so you're not seeing the connections to it from your accounting department. That's the idea. The the sort of era of digital transformation and every everyone moving everything to microservices or to cloud hostage storage solutions has enabled a lot of application backends and databases to be sitting on the internet instead of sitting, you know, on the intranet. So the Timeline we're going to talk about today is DEF CON to DEF CON, so last August to this August. And I might not hit your favorite data leaks, but I'm trying to hit the trends. So these are my favorite data leaks. You might have others. We can talk about them later. And the major categories we're going to go over are hard-coded creds um, being found in public code on like the GitHubs, GitLabs, and Bitbuckets of the world, API misconfigurations or API vulnerabilities, um, cloud and bucket misconfigurations, or honestly, in a lot of cases, lack of configuration where some of these are public by default. Um, ransomware leak pages, which is sort of the breach to leak pipeline, and then insider incidents. So the hard-coded creds in public code um, is as simple as it sounds, right? These are creds that someone committed to uh, a Git repository. Oftentimes, in a lot of the cases we'll look at, it's like a vendor of a vendor hired a dev shop, and they accidentally have their repos public. Um, and one of the devs committed a secret uh, to a repo that has no stars. It's like totally off in you know, nowhere land, but someone finds it, finds a hard-coded credential, and then uses it for something. Uh, and the obvious place to use the credential first is where it was intended, but the more interesting places are to plug it into admin portals, which we see a lot of people do, throwing them in AWS, you know, uh, tenant logins, throwing them in like ADP or Workday to get uh, HR data or tax information, and then throwing them into suites where there'd be tickets, internal documentation, all the sort of internal things that IT teams are worried about, or even better, plugging them into like Okta to see, you know, if you can get through that, you can get into anything that's connected to it, which is very helpful. So the two big ones, uh, the two big hard-coded credential incidents uh, that I think are most emblematic of the trend are Atlassian, which was relatively small, um, but done by a group called SiegeSec, which has been very active this year, especially recently. They've been on an absolute tear. Um, they're the, the furry hacker group, uh, they call themselves. Uh, they found hard-coded creds in a public repo that they used to log into Envoy. Uh, the creds worked in Envoy, and Envoy is like a uh, badge management system. That, that's part of what they offer. So they got the employee information of all of the offices and all of the people going to and from there. The records of that were emails, phone numbers, full name, and what they claim is lots more. Um, and when I say record, by the way, when we're talking about records here, think of it like a row in a spreadsheet. It's in, in some cases, it's as little as a name in an email, and in some cases, it's like everything about the user, their identity information, all the sort of federated stuff that you would see when you're in like AD or whatever the database we're looking at is storing. Now with Toyota, um, this was a lot more records. This was closer to 300,000 uh, customer records, which was management numbers, email addresses, and a bunch of other stuff that Toyota has not talked about. But this was uh, the same situation, which is a development subcontractor left an access key in a repo that they accidentally had public for years. It was since 2017, which is very common. This is long before GitHub started asking you to not put secrets um, in your code. They found it in September of 2022. Um, and those were two of the big ones. There's been a lot more of these, but a lot of them are smaller um, in size. And I'm kind of trying to ramp up in terms of the level of interestingness. Uh, API misconfigs or API vulnerabilities uh, have been hugely popular this year with uh, people exchanging data, especially in volume. One of the most common ones that like, is in an overwhelming majority of these cases is BOLA, broken object level authorization, which is just when you adjust the query parameter of a legitimate request to an API to get something else. So you figure out what the pattern is for user IDs or for whatever it is that the parameter you're looking at does, iterate through all of them and download as much of whatever the database is as you can. And the instances of those that were particularly large, and then there's a small one, but it was a fun one. Um, WhatsApp had 500 million phone numbers 
uh, pulled over what was a presumed API volume, they didn't disclose exactly what it was, that allowed enumeration of user records at a massive scale. Uh, their, their actual market share is like over a billion, it's like one and a half billion, I think, users of WhatsApp, it might be more now. Um, so 500 million records represents a significant amount of that uh, customer base. So these are active, accurate phone numbers that are super, you know, a phone number doesn't sound that important, but it is massively helpful for wide ranging scam operations, you know, uh, call operations, fraud operations that involve legitimate phone numbers. Um, and now 500 fresh, active, real people's phone numbers are out there in the wild, so they don't have to guess so much anymore. Uh, the T-Mobile one was huge also, and this is T-Mobile's like fourth major incident in the last several years. Uh, this was 37 million records, also from a vulnerable API, which I believe was a, 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 a bowl of vuln also, um, which had exposed T-Mobile customer data, which was all the customer PII, nothing, no usernames and passwords luckily, but names, addresses, dates of birth, phone numbers, plan information, the kind of stuff that's really helpful for more commodity scam operations. And then the US Patent and Trademark Office one was particularly interesting, this one was recent. They had an, inter an internal API that was accidentally public facing and over permissioned. Um, and whoever accessed it used it to download 61,000 domicile addresses for patent applicants. The interesting part there is a lot of people who apply for patents are relatively important and also value their privacy strongly. But when you file for a patent, you have to provide the address of where you live in addition to where you do business. So this is like the home address of the people filing for intellectual property, either independently or mostly on behalf of companies, uh, which was particularly interesting. The next big topic is cloud and bucket misconfigurations, which this has been a thing for years now and really hasn't moved that much. You can still, with a couple of uh, very simple Google dorks, find hordes of uh, S3 buckets, Azure spaces, um, GCP's storage solution, DigitalOcean spaces, which is a competitor to all of them. Uh, you can still find files in a lot of those. This is actually a screenshot I took um, yesterday while doing some last minute changes to the slide, just so I had fresh stuff in it. This was lip just in the first page of results. Um, on Google, and this was actual, this is some kind of like database backup, these are insert into statements. So some kind of database backup of user entries into uh, this company's database. The first one is admin admin, the second one is test, and then all the ones under that were users, and it was uh, several hundred of them. So just scraping the surface of what's out there. Uh, so some of the bigger cloud and bucket misconfig incidents uh, of the last year, uh, Luxottica being the, uh, definitely the larger of all of them, which was uh, the actor behind it on breach forums hinted at it being a, uh, a bucket, an exposed bucket, or some flavor of exposed storage uh, that had all of the, from a Luxottica um, vendor, and Luxottica makes all the sunglasses that we all wear. They're like the monopoly of sunglasses companies, so their customers are everyone, anyone who's bought sunglasses. So this was the customer PII of every retail customer of Luxottica going back a long time. It's 70 million uh, you know, sales records. Uh, Truthfinder was 19 million records, and finally we're getting into the space of uh, passwords, emails, usernames, uh, being in the leaks, which is where, you know, cred stuffing starts uh, becoming very useful when those leaks get public uh, with, you know, fresh passwords and fresh emails, this case being a ton of them. 19 million, you know, functional usernames and passwords, which uh, a lot of PIs, I just imagine that's a job that a lot of older um, gentlemen would have. and they also have a tendency to reuse creds in a lot of places. I don't mean to, you know, I'm sorry if you're an older gentleman in the crowd, but I'm sure you don't reuse creds, but your friends might. It's very common. <laughs> so uh, they downloaded the uh, database, misconfigured, way over permissioned. Um, and Truthfinder is a background check application. So not only PIs, but tons and tons of corporate uh, users, lots and lots of background investigations going on in there. And also people, you know, conducting background investigations value their privacy. So this was a really interesting one. Capita um, has had a really big year. They're in financial services. They had a big ransomware incident that affected a lot of customers. And totally separate from that, a researcher that I'm sure you guys are familiar with, uh, Kevin Beaumont, found an S3 bucket that had a massive internal file repository of like 655 gigs um, of files, which Capita initially was like, those are supposed to be out there, okay? This is an app, it's supposed to be public, this is all intentional. And then uh, Kevin posted some files that had hard-coded creds written into them, it was like code documentation, and then it disappeared immediately and they never spoke on it again. So 
Uh, another emblematic uh, of the S3 bucket issue that, that continues to run rampant. And then Toyota, which um, we've already mentioned, another, they had another big one this year, which was two and a half million records. This one is particularly unique um, of the 2023 leaks because what, what was made public was a database of T-Connect activity for Lexus Japan, which had been leaking for uh, a very long time and had an, an, an interesting combination of, um, I'm calling it PII because you could put it together to an address, but um, it was the ID numbers for vehicles that Toyota used and the real-time location of all of the vehicles in the T-Connect suite, which was all Lexus vehicles in Japan. And in Japan, Lexus is, you know, a lux that is, those are luxury cars bought in fleets by governments and companies. So it doesn't take, you know, you don't have to be that creative to figure out uh, why the real-time location of vehicles would be valuable for someone with nefarious intent of wealthy people uh, in Japan. So that one was, uh, was really unique and particularly problematic. Basically, if you'd refresh the database, you're constantly getting the updated geolocation of the cars. Uh, another one that is sort of in the leak to breach pipeline that ended up being really big this year is ransomware leak pages which have been around for you know, a little while, but particularly this year, uh, ransomware groups really stepped up and invested in their PR um, and put together you know, kind of nice looking UIs uh, for their leak data. So what they do now, if you haven't seen these before, is when they get hooks into a company, um, they will make an entry for them on a public page. This is also a screenshot I took two days ago of the Lockbit page. So this is the Lockbit ransomware group. When they get your hooks, when they get their hooks into your environment, They'll put a timer, they'll put your domain, a timer, and a summary of the files that they exfilled, which usually, if they spread far and wide enough, is kind of everything. Like, they'll get their hands on uh, a ton, a ton, a ton of stuff inside the environment. And then they'll have a timer on there uh, for when you have to pay the ransom by, and which anyone can see. And sometimes, in that example in the bottom right corner, which was for a school, um, a price. So uh, a price, it might have been a school or a bank. A lot of these were schools, which is uh, really bad, and we'll get into in a second. Um, but that's been a, a, an interesting development. And if you don't pay the ransom, then all of the files are made publicly accessible to uh, any, you know, anyone on the internet. You can go to this Onion link right now and download anyone who hasn't paid the ransom, all of their files. So this has been a, a pretty horrific trend um, in the last year. And the victims have been a lot of kids. So the ransomware leak pages, the some of the larger leak incidents uh, on the leak pages this year a lot by the same groups who've been targeting education. Uh, the Colorado Department of Higher Education, which hosts 800,000 students you know, now, but this is also historical data contained in the leak, um, and about 55,000 staff had a ransomware incident with a public leak page, didn't pay the ransom. All of, it, all of it's public, you can go download it now, which had student names, uh, their social security numbers, student IDs, and then a wide variety of academic and disciplinary records um, for the students current and a lot of former. The Minneapolis or Minneapolis public school system, uh, same deal except what they said is uh, current, the impacted is current and former students, parents, staff, and vendors. Uh, and if you look at the files contained in the exposure, which has been analyzed by a lot of groups at this point, it is straight up everything. Like the, the ransomware groups exfilled every file this school had, it seems like, um, and any, any piece of personal information you could imagine a school would have about a student was made public um, and was a part of this record. One of the other larger ones was the LA Unified uh, School District, which is a big school district in LA County. Um, about half a million students currently and 74,000 staff, um, but lots of historical data in this one too. The threat actor uh, bought creds um, on the dark web. Someone was selling uh, remote access creds um, in a small dump. Uh, they bought the creds, logged into some remote access portal. I, I don't know if it was, it, it's not clear in the reports if it was SSH or RDP or what, but they bought creds. Those creds got them remote access, um, you know, relatively simply, nothing too complicated there. And then they deployed the payload once they got in. It spread around um, and the ransom was not paid and the files were leaked. Uh, and also in a lot of cases, you'll find even if the ransom is paid, these files end up finding their way onto the internet anyway. Um, which contained student SSNs, student passports, scans of students' passports, um, student assessments, uh, copies of driver license for anyone who parked on the um, school property. Um, kind of another one of those everything bunches. And then uh, the same group uh, successfully targeted, the same group from several of these targeted uh, UK schools 
and in the same league did like 14 of them. Uh, the size of them really ranges widely. I couldn't get a confident number on it, um, but student SEN information, student passport scans, uh, salary and bank information for employees um, was in the leak data. So schools have been hit really hard this year um, by ransomware groups, and a lot of that data has ended up on the internet um, because a lot of them are, are mandated to not, um, not pay the ransom and are also very under-resourced in terms of uh, backups and, and budget. Um, so the last category to get into is the insider events. Uh, there have only been a couple really, uh, really compelling ones this year. The example we have here is someone posting CIA intelligence briefs in a Minecraft uh, Discord group, which was a really fun one that happened, uh, you know, this year. Um, they they're responding to someone in a thread who uh, said they're not overly sensitive, and they said, "Here, have some leaked uh, documents." So these showed up in a. Uh, a group a Discord gaming channel where a bunch of people were talking about military stuff. This guy worked, um, he was an Air National Guard um, intelligence officer with a lot, you know, access to way more intelligence data and SOPs than he uh, probably should have been permissioned to. Um, and he was, people in the group said they were very impressed with how he was able to predict uh, world events going on. Turns out he had access to all these files and then eventually he just starts sharing them with the group and they find their way into, um, actual you know nation state adversaries hands so that one was hundreds of classified files um, from the uh, Air National Guard intelligence officer um, originally posted to uh, his gaming discord for clout which worked uh, but then he was arrested for espionage which means his clout is not as valuable anymore um, the classified files had Intel briefs human collection SOPs strategic intelligence on the current stuff going on the current war in Ukraine and a bunch of other stuff those are just the the more high-level categories. Now, Tesla, I put an asterisk on because this is not really a leak in the traditional sense and not the kind we're talking about, but insider whistleblower files also typically find their way onto the internet after being shared around, and this has been shared with a lot of journalists, but I haven't seen the files show up anywhere yet, uh, so asterisk there, but the data was leaked this year. This was a disgruntled ex-employee which Tesla claims um, was denied a promotion, and that's why he got mad. Um, he leaked a bunch of internal files to a German news outlet, and they contained safety complaints around Tesla's full self-driving software uh, and safety concerns about all flavor of automation, automated driving that, that Tesla was doing, and contained internal guidance, which ended up being something the media latched onto a lot, of, which was very controversial, is guidance instructing employees who were diagnosing these issues or answering the phones not to uh, write anything down about the issues, but specifically to, uh, if, if you do feel like something has to be written down, get lawyers involved, but mostly just try and keep the person on the phone and have nothing in, no emails, no texts, nothing in the ticketing systems um, so that the issues aren't, you know, there's no paper trail associated with them. Um, and then there was also apparently several files that contained 100,000 current and former employment records uh, for employees and contractors of Tesla, which had names, socials, salary information, uh, emails, bank details, and a couple other categories on everyone. Uh, up to and including the CEO. Uh, a couple honorable mentions that didn't fit into the categories that we talked about um, were the TSA. This was a Jenkins server that had creds on it. The person who uncovered this did an amazing write-up on it. You definitely should just look up TSA no-fly list leak and you'll find it. Uh, this is something they just found while poking around on Shodan, logged into the uh, Jenkins server and there was a file called nofly.csv. Downloaded the file, one and a half million names of the TSA no-fly list. So. Uh, this is the time we're living in. Uh, names, aliases, and birthdays of the uh, TSA no-fly list. Uh, another interesting pair is, even though the breach forum's leak itself was small, raid forums went down after the founder was arrested, uh, you know, a while ago, and then exposed forum, uh, well then breach forums got very popular with the exodus of raid forum users, um, and exposed forum, okay, so raid forum collapses, breach forum gets popular. Breach Forum collapses after the arrest of its admin. Exposed Forum leaks the Raid Forum's user DB on their forum, which starts just like a leak war between all of the different forums. Oni Forum spins up, which then leaks the Breach Forum's user database, the old Breach Forum's user database on their forum. And now all of these forums still, I mean, except Raid Forums, still like sort of come and go from the public, different admins take over. Um, but right now, if you go on like the new Oni forums or Breach forums or uh, any of the still active ones, um, you'll see a lot of leaks of other criminal community or dark web community or hacker forum sort of uh, leaks. They're, they're just 
getting each other's databases and leaking them out there, which the, the only really compelling part about those records is uh, like the username and password combos are useful, but these are probably people who don't reuse credentials too often. But the emails associated with them ended up being a lot of people's personal emails when registering these accounts on old aliases with, you know, before they maybe developed any sort of good, uh, you know, security sort of, uh, uh, I don't know what the term I'm looking for is, but any OPSEC, thank you, uh, any sort of OPSEC uh, in their operation. So that one is really interesting and probably the reason that the, the war continues because people are reusing each other's old credentials uh, to, to access the admin portals of the, the various forums. And this, I'm sure this will continue for, for many, many months. It's, it's still active now. So I called it Leakonomics 101. So in the spirit of academic, uh, the theme of academia, I'm gonna do senior superlatives for the leaks. Do you, if you guys don't know what superlatives are, they're like awards you give to students, like most popular, best dressed, that sort of thing. This might be funny, it might not, but I'm gonna try, okay? So the most unique leak of the year was definitely Toyota's car one. Uh, this one was wild, I've, you know, two and a half or 2.1 something million live locations of vehicles um, is undeniably uh, one of the most unique data leaks we've seen in the last year. Uh, the Class Clown Award, and this is not nice, but I'll say something nice about them later, is definitely T-Mobile, because they've had like f so many of these major incidents in the last couple of years, um, which leads me to the Best Friends Award, uh, which I think goes to Toyota and T-Mobile. Toyota, <laughs> Toyota had two big ones this year, and uh, T-Mobile has had a lot uh, in the last year. And then the most likely to do it again award, and this is not gonna be T-Mobile, I'm not gonna pick on them again, but any guesses, who's most likely to have another big data leak? Tesla, that's one vote. TSA, that's a, that's a good one. Uh, actually, it was T-Mobile. <laughs> I couldn't have predicted that. But it's fun to laugh at them, but I'm sure they're very stressed out, and like the security staff, this is a laugh with them, because I'm sure they've been begging for more budget to prevent all of these incidents, but uh, you know, pour one out for the, the team at T-Mobile. It's definitely not a good, not a fun time to be in that security operation. Uh, most likely to be famous is the clout garnered by the DOD guy, which I think he succeeded in. I, he was, he is very, in his community, he was very popular um, and very famous for a minute there. Uh, best dressed uh, is definitely going to none other than Luxottica just because they make beautiful sunglasses that we all wear. Okay, a little, a little wrap up of just the leaks we talked about. There's a lot that I didn't get to talk about. There's a lot that happened this year, but in just what we've discussed, uh, we saw about 630 million total records. And these are not necessarily unique, all of them. I'm sure in the, in the range of hundreds of millions were unique, uh, but these are records ranging from, like I said, individual things like fields of phone numbers, emails, or large combinations of very much identifiable information. Uh, 30 plus major leaks are what we covered, which in contained within them in terms of what is practically usable immediately was about 20 million fresh username, email, and password combos, uh, which like I said, immediately usable and valuable in adversarial uh, operations and uh, you see bad guys doing that quite a bit now. Uh, 1.4 million social security numbers, which is overwhelmingly um, from the student leaks. So that's a lot of uh, minors social security numbers um, and probably in the at least tens or hundreds of thousands of passports because those were leaked from there as well and driver's licenses of mostly minors. Uh, and in terms of, uh, I called it economics, which would infer that there's an economic component to this, but honestly the only money figure that would be interesting is how much money it costs to clean up uh, what happened because the leakers in all of the cases where someone just posted the data uh, except for the WhatsApp one where they posted bundles of phone numbers, these are free. People post these online for, for internet points on like, if you go on any of the popular hacking forums now and you go to the leaks page, you'll see stuff every day, uh, you know, of varying levels of integrity, but uh, mostly people are not selling this stuff. They find it, they give it away for, you know, for clout among their group or on their forum. Uh, so they're not making money off this. They're doing lots and lots of very quantifiable damage, um, but, in terms of uh, you know the economics behind it, they're not making a whole lot of uh, whole lot of cash. The the raw leakers themselves, 
And then another fun little number is uh, something I read in the Bitdefender report from this year is 40% of security professionals have been instructed not to report breaches and leaks. So it's also overwhelmingly likely that this is a very, very, very small flavor of what actually happened and is just the stuff that ended up very much in the public eye. Um, but in terms of record counts, username and password combos, um, and potentially money that was made, uh, I'm sure it's a lot larger than this. So some predictions for the future. Uh, and this is based on actions GitHub took and the, the, you know, the rise in DevSecOps products and the sort of like moving, trying to move security left in the development pipeline is hopefully a steady decline in hard-coded cred problems. There's lots still out there that you could go find right now um, on any of the Git sites. Um, but new ones are uh, less frequent. It's, you're less often going to come by those because GitHub will, st will attempt to stop commits that it thinks has secrets in it um, and will warn you of that. And most people are, are putting stuff on GitHub. But all the old stuff is, is still out there. So even though uh, hopefully volume decreases, it, it certainly doesn't mean impact will because someone gets you know, a hold of the right old credential that's been out there for a couple years. Uh, that has access to like a database that has hundreds of thousands or millions of usernames and passwords, and even though it's less incidents, still very high impact of the ones that do happen. Um, I'm sure this has already kind of happened in, in a couple very small incidents, but a couple, I'm uh, assuming a couple major LLM app backends will leak conversation data uh, and the secrets embedded within, um, which again has only happened in small flavors so far, but a lot of these apps are spinning up, you know, haphazardly in with mostly microservice infrastructure. Uh, which you know talks to the services are talking to each other on the internet. So this kind of stuff is is very much built with internet accessibility um, in mind. And I'm sure the conversation data and and the the secrets or or corporate information or personal information uh, embedded in those conversations, if present in a public bucket of some kind, uh, will be very interesting. And then honestly, a lot of the same. Um, most of the issues I talked about have have been around in some form for a while. Um, and, but most of them have, have, they vary in popularity. It comes and goes in trends based on what technology is being adopted rapidly. But I, I don't think 2024 um, will, I don't see any of these trends declining in a major way except for hopefully hard-coded secrets. And uh, to use buzzwords improperly, uh, shift left is what you hear about when you think about DevSecOps. But in terms of what all of this means in understanding adversarial operations, um, bad guys have shifted left in, in the sense that exfilling the crown jewels in the actual exfiltration stage of the MITRE ATT&CK framework is not so necessary uh, when the crown jewels can be found just on the internet. So again, like I said before, why, go, why maintain complicated infrastructure and burn your, you know, burn your TTPs several times in a campaign when the right Google search uh, finds something that maybe two years ago wasn't on SharePoint Online, but now it is. Uh, so bad guys take note of this, and uh, you see a lot of groups front-loading um, recon uh, in their campaigns instead of uh, you know, doing a, a smaller amount of recon. It makes a lot of sense to front load recon when more and more stuff is on the internet. Um, and in terms of the techniques that are in the, this is like basically what was previously the pre-attack matrix, but is now bulked into the MITRE attack matrix at large, the recon phase and resource development. Um, well, mostly the recon phases is what made up the pre-attack matrix, is now part of the main matrix. And of all the leaks we talked about, these are the categories that are relevant. It's not that many. Um, and in terms of technical complexity, these are very much so on the lower end. So these are the ones employed in the actual leaks that uh, we saw. So what can you do as a, as a person who might be concerned about leaking data or finding it before it becomes problematic? Um, and honestly, the easiest thing is whether you have several uh, people on your team, if you, if you have a dedicated red team, um, which is rare, but if you have you know, at least a few people working on uh, cyber defense in some manner with some titles, rotating defenders to do the searching uh, on Shodan, the common Google dorks for exposed buckets. And you can target these searches very much to just look for your stuff. You don't have to look at the internet at large, but you know, target your infrastructure, target tools you think you're using, and look for data or even better honey tokens that if, if in some flavor of public data set would mean something is leaking from inside you or from uh, you know, a contractor or vendor that you know handles your data. Um, and automate it to the extent that you can. You know, automate it so that you're, you're spending less time looking for the, uh, you know, looking for the 
the sources to, to connect and more looking at the data that is present on them to see if it's actually a problem. And then an easy way to do this, if you are less, if you have less defense resources and you're like, I couldn't possibly spend any time running Google Dorks, like we have so much going on internally, um, then a, a simple executive level exercise is running a tabletop with you know, whoever is relevant, legal parties, um, crisis management, to understand what, what are you gonna do when it, you know, when a data leak impacts you or when it's your infrastructure or a third party of yours. A tabletop is, you know, a low tech exercise where you're just sort of running through the scenario, mostly verbally. And these are super helpful in understanding uh, and preparing for uh, an internal or external data leak and having sort of leadership on board with, with understanding that A, it's very likely your data will be present in one or you'll leak something eventually, and B, these are not really things that people have playbooks to respond to commonly. So it's, it's smart to get ahead of uh, at least the low tech approach of understanding procedurally what to do when it does happen. So that's it, that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you guys for coming and I'll open the floor for questions. I have some extra time, so I can do it from here, thanks. Any questions? Yes. Are you? I'm sorry. I can't hear you very well. I think. Uh, are you? Are you asking uh, why it's free? Potentially, yeah. Some of the leaks are less valuable than others, but generally the fact that the data was given away for free doesn't always correlate directly with its impact. More the likelihood that someone will buy it um, or someone is willing to buy it. Like a more advanced uh, adversary group uh, will just collect the data themselves. They don't need to buy it off the shelf. The low tech, more commodity adversary groups that don't have as much money will buy you know, cheaper dumps before they come on the market. So the, the kind of data that's present in these leaks is usually employed uh, in like wide sweeping campaigns by more commodity adversary groups or like individual operators, which is I'm sure part of the reason why the economics behind it are so odd and people don't pay money for it. But yeah, I mean, some are more valuable than others. Like a lot of groups have no use for phone numbers, uh, but have a lot of use for fresh logins and passwords that they can start spraying in, in external portals. So it's, a, it's kind of a complicated answer, but um, to, yes, basically. Yeah, yes. Do you mean things you can do to well, get people to change no, passwords? No, like, on the side of the malicious uh, attacker, what, what is like the intent or purpose to fear monger universities into changing their passwords? Oh, I don't know why they would want you to change your passwords. Wouldn't they want you to not change your passwords so that if they get them, they can... Yeah, I don't know. That's not an adversary then. That's a friend. That's someone helping you out. <laughs> I might be misunderstanding your question though. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. Any other questions? Yes. It depends, like the Pentagon files, uh, I don't think so. I don't think you can download classified um, stuff if you're not like, you know, if you're just some guy not in a skiff. But um, some of it, uh, there's like mixed sort of, I'm not a lawyer, um, but I have asked lawyers this question several times because like most of my work is, is dealing in the world of leaking data. Um, and the answers range from it's a gray area to if it is accessible with an IP address from anywhere, it's not blocked from any sort of connection, then it is public domain, the information, and is legally treated as public domain. Um, but I, that said, I still wouldn't just download every leak you see uh, because I'm sure, you know, I'm sure there, it is a lot more complicated than that. But like, you know, companies commercially download these leaks all the time for use in their, uh, in their tools and in their operations defensively. But if you're, as long as you're buying the information or hopefully obtaining it for free with like a defensive intent, no one's gonna come after you for it. 
uh, most likely. Um, but the answer is, it depends, sort of. If the data is classified, then yeah, definitely not. But some of it is, is definitely public domain. Yes? Uh, this is a bit of a two-part question and maybe a little bit loaded. <laughs> Yeah, I think the GDPR question is good. So the question was, are any of these companies being held accountable? And um, would a GD, uh, GDPR being enforced, I guess, in the US broadly, um, be helpful in preventing these in the future? And to answer that question, definitely. If you had to have controls in place um, to make sure that these data sets, usernames and passwords, classified data, regulated data was not public, um, then I'm sure it would, it would have a positive impact. It might not fix everything, because this still happens, and a lot of the companies we talked about do have a lot of business, some of them headquarters um, in GDPR enforced areas. So it, would, it certainly would not fix the problem, but I don't see it hurting uh, necessarily. Um, and then what was the other, what was the second question? Oh, right, are they being held accountable? Yeah, um, mostly no. Um, sometimes yes, but in a lot of cases with the, the nature of the data ending up being public domain, I, I mean, honestly, a lot of these are from the last year, and sometimes for the enforcement body to like investigate the case and then issue a fine is well over a year. Uh, so these are pretty fresh. I could see a few of them definitely being enforced and massive fines being levied, um, but for a lot of them, like the ransomware leak ones especially, definitely not, right? That's, uh, you're a victim of a, of a, uh, a crime at that point. Um, but uh, no, uh, of the ones I talked about, I don't think any fines have been levied yet. Uh, I might have missed the news about it, but um, I'm sure a few will, at least. Yes, of course. Is there any difference in the marketplaces between like the Clearware, Reach4, and the Dartmouth stuff, and the Clearware, say, Steam box? Yeah. Um, there is a difference, yes. The, the like more clear web ones are usually where you see someone posting a massive database of like, here's all the usernames and passwords for this like, you know, delete my tweets app that a bunch of people use to like clear their Twitters. But uh, when you start getting into the invite only groups, the, the, the groups like on Telegram, that things you have to be invited to, um, or like have to, you know, weasel your way into, or they're, uh, you know, specifically invite only, uh, generally, they're not dealing in volume quite as much as they are quality. So they're not so interested in showing off to each other for clout. They're more interested in uh, whatever their mission is and like sharing information relevant uh, to the mission. So it's, it's a lot more like fidelity over volume, whereas on the forums it's like, I popped 500 million creds. That's like, you know, that's a, it, it's, it's totally different um, motives. Was there? Yeah, and you'll see you'll see both on both, um, but mostly it's like it's sort of like quality and quantity differences between the the more narrow groups. Gotcha. All right, I'm cut off in time, but if you guys have any more questions, I'll be in the uh, the room over there. Thank you.